Um, this is, presentation is for educational purposes only. I'm not a broker dealer, licensed financial advisor, or registered financial advisor. This information is not construed as an offer or solicitation of an offer, but to buy or sell securities. You should be fully responsible for any investment decision you make, and such decisions will be based solely on your evaluation of your financial circumstances, investment objectives, risk tolerance, and liquidity needs. So uh, please, you know, read through the rest of the uh, legal information, as I have to put that up there. Um, but, uh, to, to, you know, to recap what I was saying before I hit record, apologize for, for that, is what I'm going to be talking about is the nested iron condor and the higher volatility environment that we're going through right now. And um, I have been talking to Tom for a while about starting a nested iron condor service. And I think this is a great time to um, launch that because it tends to do even better um, when the volatilities are higher. So, and I think that we are, um, you know, going to probably stay in a little bit of a higher volatility environment for a while. So um, it does well in the lower volatility environments as well, but it tends to do better in the higher volatility environments. So I think it's a, a you know, good timing for that. So, um, so with that, let's uh, uh, get started on the presentation. Again, uh, real quick, uh, anybody who has joined um, since I started, um, apparently WebEx is having a bug in the uh, chat. So if you have any questions, uh, please change the send to to, uh, I should have my name up there somewhere, so please change it to m my name and you can send me a message directly. People won't be able to see the messages, um, but I will be going through those and answering questions. If you have any technical questions, please send them to Tom. Um, and uh, so let's uh, move forward here. Whoops, that's not what I want to close that off. Here we go. Um, so I'll be looking at that throughout. Uh, so again, so I'm going to be talking about the higher volatility environment that we're in and how uh, the nested iron condor relates to that. Um, so first, I'm just going to talk about, you know, I'm sure a lot of you know what it is, um, but I'm just going to go through briefly what is the nested iron condor. Um, it's basically, uh, it's, it is, you know, it's a standard iron condor, credit spreads on the puts, credit spreads on the calls, very high probability trade, 80% or above uh, profitable um, trades can be done in the indexes like the RUT, the SPX, the NDX, ETFs, and stocks. Um, the way I've set it up, it follows a basic set of rules, but there are trader's choice interpretation to that, but not, not as much as like my weird or. So there is, but it's a, it's a simpler um, trade, uh, very uh, easy adjustments because um, we're just dealing with credit spreads. That's all we're dealing with, and um, you know, you're putting them on and you're taking them off. Uh, you know, rolling them or putting them on or taking them off. So it's pretty pretty simple as far as the type of adjustments that are being done. Um, so what does it look like? So uh, as you guys probably guessed from the uh, name, the nested condor, um, it's exactly that. It's basically two spreads on each side of calls and the puts that are nested within each other. Um, so the shorts are actually spread over two stripes. Um, and as you can see here in this little Di uh, this little box here, um, for instance, I've got um, on the call side, I've got uh, 10 spreads um, from the uh, on the 939. This was done, um, I think, in 2011. So the uh, um, the, the strike prices are a little bit uh, different than what they are today. Uh, but the 930, 960 strikes for the calls, and then another um, credit spread at the 940, 970 calls, in this case, 30 points wide, making a combined um, to uh, credit spreads on the call side, and then again on the put side. So they're kind of nested within each other. Um, so, and you know, why do I do this and why do I like it? I like that it divides the risk of the shorts. And it might seem really simple, like, well, you know, big deal, just put them all on the further one or the closer one, uh, why spread them apart? And I've done condors for a long time. Um, and, you know, that's the way I always traded them was just, you know, put them on the same strike and manage the trade from there. Um, and it's fine. It works works great. However, what I found with the nested version is that um, because I like the, the way I, I trade the condors and the way I like to do my adjustments kind of on the early side, I found that it makes the adjustments easier and less painful when they have to be done. Um, so uh, that was one of the one of the reasons why I like this so much. And it's also really well suited for very wide um, point spreads. So whether you're doing, you know, the Russell or the or the SPX, uh, the NDX can be a little wild. I don't like to trade that as much. Um, or, you know, ETFs or whatever. You can do really wide um, strikes so you can set them apart 
and uh, that way you can nest them within each other and then any rules that are done are further nested so um, it makes it well suited for that um, so just some basic guidelines um, for the Russell 2000 at least um, but these would be very similar um, Typically, I like to do this trade with 60 to 70 days to expiration. And to be honest, with the higher volatility, I like it to be more like the, um, even in a lower, more, more than the 70, such actually should be updated. 70 to 85 days to expiration is what I would be doing now. Um, the longer, you know, the longer time frame, of course, coming into play with the choppy, really choppy high volatility environments um, that, you know, we're, we're going into a little bit higher volatility at this point. Again, um, Uses wide spreads, 20, 30 points, um, it, you know, can be done in the uh, 20 points as well. Um, and I like to adjust early. I'm, I'm not waiting for, uh, you know, the standard guidelines of a lot of the iron condors out there where you wait for the shorts to get to a 20 delta. Um, I just feel that it's too, too late to do it at that point. Not too late, but you're just taking too much of a loss at that point. So I like to adjust early, get out of the way, and let the probabilities um, fall in my favor. So it's very much a probability trade. It's not a trade by the Greeks uh, trade where you're trying to keep the T plus zero line flat. It's very much on uh, probabilities and having targets for profits and losses. Um, and usually that uh, those particular rules uh, will, you know, allow for a very high uh, win rate and some pretty nice profits, especially when the volatility is higher, you get a lot more premium. Um, Again, I like to exit the spreads as soon as I can. I'm not waiting for nickels. Uh, it's close enough. I'm, I'm good. Uh, also, that you know, some trader's choice comes into play there with the, um, the you know, what's going on in the market and so forth. Um, you know, which is where I'm talking about here at the last bullet point, where I, you know, watch the market conditions, uh, the days to expiration, and how much profit I already have in the trade. Um, so, as I mentioned, you know. Uh, the reason why I'm talking about this now is because of the higher volatility market that we are um, beginning to go into. You know, a lot of times the market, of course, generally you know grinds for a while. It goes into whatever it's going to be in low volatility market, high volatility, whatever it is. In in our case, in uh, 2015, a much lower volatility market, and then we have um, that change that comes where we go from one type of uh, market environment to another and usually during that change especially when you're you know obviously with these theta trades when you're going from a low volatility to a high volatility um, and you're already in the middle of a trade uh, you know it gets pretty scary you know it, well not so scary but you know you're usually going to have some trouble you're going to have lots of adjustments and um, it's going to be that during that transition time it's not that much fun uh, it doesn't mean it can't be profitable but usually during those changes um, it can be a little bit wild. Uh, once that change has, you know, that transition has been made, however, and you're in the new environment, um, it can be, you know, well, now if there's a higher volatility, you're also going to be able to get further out of the wings and um, bring in a lot more premium. Um, so once you're in that environment, um, it's it might be very choppy and it might be very volatile, but you're already um, taking, you know, uh, that's already been taking into effect with the premium um, that you can get much further out into the uh, uh, into the wing. So that's where it helps. So as you can see here, what I've done is I've just put together, um, I started trading the nested iron condor, you know, I've been trading condors for a long time, you know, since 2006. Um, the nested one, I really started working on it in 2010, towards the end of 2010, and then really went um, uh, full year uh, starting in 2011, uh, well, full year as far as the um, expiration month. I always go by expiration month. Um, so I've uh, uh, kind of put together, you know, what was the volatility during that time. So when I started trading the Nesson Iron Condor, I started trading it um, starting the January 2011 expiration month. And the January through October expiration month time, which actually started a couple months earlier, so it would have been uh, probably October of 2010 through, uh, let's say, August of 2011, um, which would correspond with these uh, expiration times, um, we averaged about a 24 on the RVX. So for the Russell 2000, which is what I was trading, we averaged about a 24. And I can go back and take a look at the VIX, but you know that would have been high as well. So, um, so we averaged about a 24. And then the last couple expiration months, of the year, we actually had some spikes above 35. 
So we had some pretty decent volatility throughout the year with some wild stuff going on at the end. Um, and in 2012, uh, you know, it even got uh, the average was even higher, a 28 uh, volatility. And then um, as things started to settle after all the, you know, the whole craziness of 2008 and 2009 and um, all of the wild choppiness of 2011 and 2012, um, things started to settle down. And all of a sudden we started to get into a lower volatility environment. And as you can see, towards the end of 2012, uh, the volatility for the Russell 2000 dropped down to the 1920 level. Um, and then it continued to drop and in 2013 came all the way down to the 17 level. Um, and then, you know, and so on and so forth. And as you know, in 2015, uh, the Russell 2000 volatility was like, you know, in the 15 area. So it's pretty, pretty low. Uh, and the reason why I bring that up is because let's, you know, I, I want to show you how the results of the nested iron condor did during these different time periods. So as you can see here in 2011, 2012, um, which is where, let's go back here, where I had that higher volatility, 24, 28, and so forth. Um, the average adjustments per trade were one and a half to two times. So, I, you know, somewhere between there, I had to make adjustments. Um, got a little bit more in, in, um, as we went through. And the average percent gain of max risk was anywhere from five and a half to eight percent. A little bit higher in 2011 than it was in 2012. And I'll go through those results as well in detail. Um, in 2013, uh, when the volatility dro started to drop, um, and averaged around 17 for the Russell. As you can see, you know, the adjustments didn't really change much. You know, we were kind of grinding higher, so they were mainly on the high, uh, on the uh, call side. Um, but as you can see here, the max gain of, uh, the percent gain of max risk per trade averaged uh, lower, about 4%. And then in uh, 2014 and 2015, um, although I didn't, trade the I don't have full year results because I started to concentrate a lot more on the um, on the uh, weird or at the time and I put mo more of my uh, margin towards that and actually the way it used margin I felt uh, with the account size that I had was better suited for the weird or during that time so I only made some uh, trades in the nested so I don't have full year results for that but as I was watching these years progress, what I noticed was the average adjustments per trade were rising and the average percent gain of max risk per trade was shrinking. So in the lower volatilities, um, especially in 2015, I felt that I was getting a little bit more bang for my buck with the weird or not that that it wasn't possible to make a profit and being very profitable um, for the uh, for the nested iron condor. Um, but I was, uh, you know, trying to, to squeeze out a little bit more and I was using the weird or to do that. So, but both trades actually, they work really well together. So, um, so if you have the uh, capital, it's, it's a pretty good choice. Um, and um, just I'm going to mention one more time because I do see a question here, which I'm going to answer. Um, uh, the, just again, just real quick, the chat for the WebEx is not working properly, so if you have any questions, please send them to me as a private message, and then I can see them. I apologize. Uh, you won't be able to see each other's questions. But uh, Mike's asking me a question. Um, Hi, Amy. I know we have brought this up in the past about this trade, but have you determined planned capital for this trade and how this impacts your annual returns? Great question. Um, yeah, this trade actually can be, because it's not, um, uh, you know, it can be done in the Russell, it can be done in the SPX, it can be done um, and ETFs and stocks and so forth. Um, again, I'm going to trade this in the Russell with a, uh, the, the alerts will be a 30 point spread, um, but I also, uh, it works very well with a 20 point spread, so that's gonna change the planned capital. But um, as an example, uh, the way I like to do this is I, um, this is a trade that because I'm putting it on early, um, you know, with 70 to 80 days to expiration, I'm gonna have, a couple of overlapping months. I don't want to have three overlapping months, but I'm gonna have a couple. So it's something to take into consideration. So what I like to do just for one expiration month is I'm starting off really small because I know with my style of trading this trade, I might have to in, you know, roll and increase um, contracts. So what that means is um, I'm going to determine based on my rules, what my possible, and most of the time I don't hit this, but what is the absolute possible if I were to 
um, roll uh, my maximum three times, and if I were to um, increase my contract side a maximum of two times each time, um, uh, you know, I'm going to whatever I start with. I don't want um, I'm going to um, end or whatever I know I'm going to end up with. I'm going to start with about a third of that um, amount. So when I'm so for instance, if I'm doing a Russell 2000 trade and um, I pick a 30 point wide, wide spread, one contract for a 30 point wide spread is three thousand um, dollars. So obviously this is nested, so I'm going to have a minimum of two. Um, so that would be six thousand dollars. And because I'm going to possibly be rolling this in increasing size, I want to triple that. So my minimum for a 30 point in the Russell would be about eighteen thousand um, dollars, or you know probably best as a uh, twenty to twenty five thousand dollar account size um, for something like that. But um, uh, you know that might might not get hit. Um, so hopefully that helps. And of course. Uh, if you do a 20 point wide in the Russell, that obviously changes that to 2000 per contract um, and then triple that. And um, and if you have obviously uh, a minimum of two contracts because they're nested, um, that would be $4,000. So $12,000 would be uh, for a 20 point uh, nested condor. Um, and then, of course, you want to add. You don't want to use up all your margins, so you add wiggle room there. The other thing is, of course, these can be overlapping if you do them every month. Um, so that also has to be taken into consideration. However, you can also lower the amount of planned capital um, by using ETFs. This is a trade that can be done in ETFs. So that can considerably lower that as well. So, um, and uh, Or it can go higher. You can do uh, the, the SPX and do a 50-point wide. So um, it really depends on which underlying and if you choose to do um, you know how far your spreads are going to be um, and I'm going to go over uh, not in this presentation but a part of the service that I'm going to be coming up with or starting I should say um, I'm going to go over different versions of it so I might be doing a trade alert for you know my standard 30 point nested but um, I'm going to be talking about a lot of the different versions 20 points and an ETF or SPX possibly one month or whatever so you can kind of see how that takes effect um, I hope that kind of answers your question. Um, I'll put it a little in a little bit more detail um, when I uh, when I start uh, um, the service with the uh, with the different types of trades that you can do. So that's a great question, and I will follow up on that. Um, okay, so uh, just as an example, when I started this in the Russell in 2011, these are expiration months. I traded 11 months on in July. I was out for the whole month. I had guests in town for about three weeks, and I decided I'm not going to trade in July, which actually turned out to be great because I think um, in July I would have been trading the September, um, yes, the September contract, and I have a feeling that would have been my one loser of the year. So I kind of got lucky there. I think um, I didn't, you know, go back and uh, back test that, but I think because of what was going on during that time, we had some pretty wild moves. Um, that could have been the one loss of the of the year, um, but you know it didn't happen and ended up um, as you can see here. This little chart kind of shows for the each expiration month in 2011 how many adjustments I did. I was kind of playing around with it in uh, January here, uh, what my percent of max risk was, and then another thing that's pretty interesting that I'm also going to go over, which which does change depending on the volatility, is my percent gain of original credit. So whatever I'm taking in at the beginning. Whatever credit I'm getting, how much of that am I keeping? And as you can see here, it's pretty high. So the average was uh, 77% um, with a high percentage of uh, gain on that max risk and pretty low average adjustments. In 2012, had very similar. Um, I did trade all 12 months. Again, everyone was a winner. This is not usual. Um, but uh, the percent gain on mass risk was a little bit lower. But again, I kept on average about 71% of the original credit received, which was really nice. Um, and now, as you can see, as my volatility really started to come down, take a look at 2013, my um, average um, adjustments, um, you know, it's kind of staying within the same range, uh, 1.75, but my percent of max risk was starting to go down a little bit. And as you can see, the big change was that the, the gain of original credit was also going down. So it's 
Um, and, it, and you can see in here that I had a lot of um, uh, adjustments where I, I did three adjustments, which if I go back to um, like 2011, I really didn't have very much of that going on. As a matter of fact, it was a couple months where I didn't have any adjustments. So, um, so the volatility and the choppiness obviously is going to affect that. Um, so, um, as I said, you know, in 2014, 2015, I was really concentrating on the weird ore, but it was still a very viable trade in those two years, um, even when we went down to the, you know, the 15s and the uh, volatility uh, for the Russell for 2015. Um, and uh, just as a aside, um, uh, and I'm going to go over some examples for 2016 in a minute, but uh, here's, uh, you know, one of, one of my students um, that took my class. I actually had a nested iron condor class in 2013 for the year. And um, so one of, my, one of my students, Bob, has been trading it successfully since then, and uh, including 2014, 2015. And so I just thought, you know, I'd include, even though I don't have full year um, results for the 2014 and 2015 years, because I didn't trade it every single month during that time, he did. And I just thought I'd share, uh, you know, a couple notes that he had sent to me. Uh, one was dated June 1st, 2015, so about halfway through uh, the 2015 year. Um, and he just says, you know, hi, Amy, it's a brief note to thank you for all you did to teach me this trade. Um, he's made a couple tweaks uh, to suit his trading personality, but his plan is essentially my plan. So, um, and it says, so far this year, I have not had a single losing trade. I'm still in July, but I've had half of the call side off and I'm up about 5% on max margin. Um, in the now seven months of this year, that 2015, I've only had to make five total adjustments. All my trades have been closed with contingent orders. And he um, then goes on to say that trading the strategy has allowed us to generate enough monthly income to pay for our multi-month trips to Europe and the Caribbean and to donate to our favorite charities as well. I, I love that. So um, the reason why I, I brought that up is because, again, you know, he's been trading it consistently um, since um, the class of 2013. And I thought it was kind of fun that, you know, he mentions his, um, you know, it's been a, it's generated enough monthly income to do these trips that he loves. Um, because I just received another note from him this morning, um, just before this WebEx started. So he mentions, you know, he's sorry that I'm sorry that I will miss your roundtable discussion this afternoon. We are in the Caribbean for a couple of months and had committed to a cocktail party this afternoon before I got Tom's email. So um, kind of nice. Um, so he's still still at it. He's still apparently, um, you know, doing well enough with it to continue his Caribbean vacations. Um, he says next that uh, I just want you to know that I'm still trading the nested. Um, high probability iron condor successfully. It is so easy to manage, even in the Caribbean, where we have some occasional internet issues. Um, so I just thought that that was kind of, um, uh, you know, a nice, not just a nice testimonial. I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but um, because, like, again, I haven't traded it all, uh, you know, through every month of 2014, 2015, I wanted to show you somebody who really has um, trading this style for uh, that time and, and has taken my class in the past. So hopefully that um, makes you guys feel, you know, pretty confident that it does do well even in that environment so um, but with that I'm going to go on to um, some examples uh, and some recent examples because as you guys know starting at uh, the end of December um, and certainly throughout January and you know most of February we've had some serious uh, change in volatility and a lot of choppiness um, some pretty big moves in both directions um, you know just constant so um, I wanted to show some recent examples of how this trade, um, you know, would do during that time. Now, of course, I didn't trade it live, but I, so what I did, because I don't want to, um, you know, tweak any of the just basic rules, I basically just traded it to the rules um, that I would follow um, during, a, you know, a very volatile time. So I would just kind of pick, you know, this is what I would do. Um, and um, so with that, uh, this is going to show uh, three, I'm going to show you three examples um, of uh, the February, March, and April expiration months. Um, the, the, this is uh, spanning the time of December 9th, 2015, through today, February 24th, um, and how these trades did. Um, and as you can see here, um, you know, not in the trade for, you know, too long and some pretty decent profit. Now, um, that can change depending on uh, timing of getting into the trade. Um, and uh, as Bob had said, he kind of tweaked 
tweak it a little bit to suit his style a little bit. Um, so he has a little bit different results for uh, the beginning of the year. But he did say, um, even though he had taken a very small loss, uh, I think the first, uh, the beginning of the year, he said that his existing trade is up 5% now. So, um, and I think he trades it a little bit uh, uh, more conservatively than, than I do. But that is one of the things that I'll be showing again with uh, different versions of this trade using uh, with the service. So you can get a feel for um, how, how, what might suit your needs um, and your style of, of, uh, or your comfort level. Um, so with that, I'm going to go into Option Net Explorer and let's go take a look at these uh, examples. Um, in the meantime, if anybody has any questions before I get started or um, during this, again, send me a message privately because the uh, all participants uh, in chat is not working. Um, and um, I will look out for those questions and answer them. So, all righty, let's get started here. And one. <clears throat> all right, whoops. Get this guy out of the way. I don't think that shows up on your screen, but. All right, so basically what I've done here is um, started this, you know, through this whole cycle of when we were going from one type of volatility uh, to another. Um, so I thought that that would be uh, a good thing to look at. So as you can see here, this is uh, December 9th when I entered the trade. And I always like to enter it uh, a little bit short delta, so I have more room to the downside than I do to the upside because this is not a, uh, you know, it's not a very flat uh, T plus zero line. As you can see, condors generally are not. So um, I want to be a little, I always want to be a little bit short um, because, you know, it's not, it's not as flat of a T plus zero line and it's also a negative vega trade. So, um, and it takes a little while for that theta to kick in. So um, as you can see here, I just chose 10 contracts on each. This could have been one. Um, but uh, I think it works better with two, and I'll show you why, but uh, for each um, credit spread, but um, I just chose 10 here just to kind of keep things even. Um, so here they are. They're uh, these are 30-point wide. Again, could have been done in 20-point wide spreads. 10 contracts each, just even it up. And as you can see, they're just spread over two strikes. So I've got the 20, 50, 20, 80 and the 2060, 2090 on the calls, and then the uh, 970, 940, and the 960, 930 on the puts. So I'm trying to get like, you know, pretty far out in the wings here, um, as you can see, um, as far as I can, and still get some decent um, credit. So here you can say I'm taking in after slippage and commission, which is, this is all based on $1 per contract commission, which is probably pretty average for most of you. Um, it's bringing in about $6,700 at this point for, for my um, premium. So um, so basically, this trade, uh, again, I started on the 9th. There really wasn't much going on at the beginning of December. So there wasn't anything to do until uh, December 21st. So I'll go, uh, let's go to the Friday before that. So you can see here the Friday before um, I make any changes. It's, just, it's been kind of, you know, moving back and forth. And I'm just kind of waiting to have, uh, you know, on either side, the uh, credit spreads to shrink down enough to where I'm just going to start taking them off. So again, I'm not as concerned about uh, my delta being flat. I'm more concerned about probabilities in this particular type of trade. So I want to keep keep track of, you know, um, taking these credit spreads off as individual spreads as early as possible, keeping track of um, targets such as um, profit targets and loss targets max loss targets. Um, so nothing, you know, nothing going on on Friday. But if I go to um, the 21st, uh, let's see here, go to the end of the day on Friday. So coming in on the 21st, um, a little bit later on in the morning, I go ahead and start peeling off some of these calls. They're just, you know, 35 cents. Why do I need to keep that on anymore? I don't know what the market's going to do. So I'm just going to take that off. So there goes one of my call spreads. Again, I'm not concerned about what it's doing to the delta. I'm just concerned about getting taking these off as soon as I can. Um, uh, so that's uh, pretty much it for that one. And then as uh, time goes by, there's really not much going on. 
until uh, the end of the month. So coming into uh, the 30th is really the next time I do anything, but I'm going to go through, uh, let's just go to the 28th. And as you can see here, it's just gaining theta. It's just kind of kicking in over here. We didn't really quite get that Christmas rally that I thought we were going to get. but um, So I basically took this into the 30th um, and took it off. And there's a couple reasons why. Number one, um, this is where this is where one it's part of my rules, but it's not exactly what you guys might uh, think. Even though I didn't get to uh, you know shrink my credit uh, uh, these uh, spreads to like you know 40, 50 cents or less. Um, at this point, it's already hit some targets. It's already basically at 70% of my original credit that I brought in, and it's also at the end of the year. So I've been in the trade for only 21 days. I'm all, you know, about, you know, 70% of my original credit has been captured very close. Um, and uh, it's, you know, and as you know, with, especially with the um, indexes, uh, the end of the year, we do, they, they do mark to market for tax purposes. So, you know, the last thing I want to do is show a gain mark to market. And then next year, coming into the beginning of the year, uh, maybe the market starts moving. In this case, it ended up doing that, but I have no idea um, what it's going to do. It could be that I maybe make a little bit more, but it also could be that I'm giving back some. And then I have, um, you know, maybe giving back a little bit of that profit or making a loss or whatever. I want to know what my tax liability is. So I like to take those, you know, take that off at the end of the year. If I want to put it back on or put something else back on, I'll put it on at the beginning of the year. So um, that's always a good reason to take something off at the end of the year. Um, so this trade was basically uh, done within 21 days, uh, which is very quick. Um, and a lot of the times, one of the things I did look at, into and did some statistics, uh, most of the time, um, you know, the market's moving up. And uh, so the, the, uh, a lot of the times um, you, you will see call side adjustments more often than put side adjustments. Sometimes there's a little bit of both. Most of the time it's usually one side or the other, though. And the other thing is that uh, most of the time, this trade is taken off with at least three weeks to expiration, sometimes two plus weeks, but a lot of times three plus weeks to expiration is left. Um, in this case, even a little bit more, um, uh, this trade usually comes off. So in this case, it was really uh, you know, nice. Volatility had come down a little bit. It really wasn't that high to begin with. Um, and I was able to take this off early. So uh, for this particular trade, Again, it was in it for 21 days, and it ended up making 7.36% profit on, um, let's see, a little bit later on in the day. When did I close this? I think I closed it closer to 7.30. Um, so after slippage and so forth, it ended up to about 7.36%. I always, even though this was a not a real trade, uh, even when I do, uh, uh, you know, simulated trades, I always add slippage in there based on, um, you know, my experience with trading the Russell for so many years. So, um, so that was February. Uh, so the next trade I'm going to show you is uh, March 2016. Uh, now, this one is during the real craziness. So this one was started on the 7th of January. I like to, I, a lot of times I like to do these on a Thursday, by the way. Um, so we had already been, uh, start of the year, and as you know, that first week of January was just horrible. Uh, you know, the market was just crazy. It was way oversold. Um, and, um, you know, as we know now, it, it continued, but we didn't, you know, I didn't know that then. So this would have been a standard time to put this trade on. You know, 71 days to expiration. Um, the volatility is getting a little higher, but it's not super high, so I don't want to go out too far. So usually on a Thursday is when I usually put these on, which is what I did um, usually around, you know, the 1030 time frame. That's what pretty much when, you know, things kind of settle, you kind of know which direction the market's going to go. And in this case, it was down. So again, getting in, short delta, short vega, a little bit of theta coming in here, more wiggle room to the downside. Um, and uh, let's go here. Oops, March is the month we're looking at. So again, I just, for example, re, you know, just for easy to look at, I just did 10 and 10 on the contract size. Go all the way down to one and one. 
Um, again, 30 point spreads, but it can also be 20 in the Russell or it could be the SPX or like I said, ETF or stocks. Um, and took in a little bit more premium, um, still pretty far away from the market as usual. I like to get into these things like, you know, with a nine or a delta of nine or lower uh, for the first uh, short on the puts and a delta of uh, 12 or lower on the first short for the calls. But if I can get out even further, I definitely want to take advantage of that. So I'm always trying to go out as far as possible. So in this case, after slippage and commissions, took in about 7,300 for this uh, 20 point or 20 contract total, 20 contracts on each side. And um, let's continue with that one. So, um, so let's see here. So the next, I really didn't have to do anything. Well, actually, I did. I just started doing that stuff a little early on this one. So, you know, going in already to Tuesday, so just a few days later, I'm already having, you know, I'm already making an adjustment. So in this particular case on Tuesday, uh, actually it was a little bit earlier in the day, uh, you know, some of my calls got pretty cheap. So I decided, okay, start peeling them off. There's no reason to keep them on. So those went, you know, those further out of the money calls are gone. Um, so, you know, I'm always concentrating on the uh, the bad side, but even while I'm concentrating on the bad side, if I need to do a roll, I want to, you know, remove uh, any profit that I'm making on the good side as well. I don't want to keep those on. I don't want to get whiplashed. I want to, you know, if I can make a decent profit on a, on a far out of the money credit spread on whatever side it's at, I'm just going to take it and, and get rid of that piece. Um, then on the next day, on the 13th, Wednesday, continue to go down the market, I uh, went ahead and took off the remaining call spreads and there they go so now we kind of just have this uh, you know puts put spreads again I'm not concerned about uh, you know in a, if this was a weirdo I'd be like ah this is not what I want but this is not a Delta uh, neutral trade this is not a uh, trade by the Greeks trade so this is a, a, lot, a lot simpler in, in essence but you know it also carries different risks uh, again, one thing I didn't mention was this trade can also be put on with some insurance as well. Uh, it doesn't quite work as well with this. It can if you put on a lot, um, but um, but you know that that's also an option which I will show um, to take any bite out of a, a large down move. Most of the time, you're just paying for that as insurance, and uh, you never get the money back. But it's just like you know, just like uh, you know, insurance that you have for you know your house or your car or whatever most of the time you're not using it so uh, but it's nice that it's there but um, anyway so let's continue here uh, then on the 14th which is the very next day pretty early in the morning here um, at seven o'clock starts to get you know to the point where um, I'm going to need to make an adjustment here on the downside so I put my first adjustment in and I roll my closest puts down and I actually roll them down 30 points. And I increase the size to try to remain as much of that uh, credit that I received as possible. In this case, I only had to increase it by four contracts. So uh, that was pretty pretty good roll for rolling down 30 points. Just want to stay out of the way of trouble, basically, and I want to do it early. Um, on the 15th uh, is my second adjustment. Um, let's go back a couple. There we go. So again, I, I, I'm hitting, getting a little too close here to my um, shorts. Uh, so I'm going to roll those down. And I, in this case, I also rolled them down 30 points and I added three contracts. Again, trying to keep as much of that original credit as I had in the first place. Give it up a little bit in this case, um, but um, you know, I could have rounded up and, and, and had the same exact amount. Um, so that was my second roll. Uh, so now, kind of, you know, going heading heading along, and it's not until the 20th, the whole, you know, a few days later, the following week. It's a little bit earlier in the morning there. There we go. That um, I hit another adjustment where I want to roll again for the third time, which is my max. I don't like to roll more than three times. And at this point, this is kind of a trader's choice is when I usually decide, you know, am I going to increase the contract side enough to, enough to keep my cost? What's going on in the market? Do I want to do that? Do I want to just roll it and not increase? Or do I want to roll it and increase a little bit? Um, in this case, for educational purposes. Um, and also, I think, you know, 
I would have thought that the market was extremely oversold at this point um, with that. So I probably would have felt comfortable rolling them. I don't think I would have increased the size uh, completely to keep the cost, but I would have increased the size of the contracts. But in this case, I went ahead and again, rolled down 30 points and increased to, uh, you know, keep most of the um, original uh, credit, gave up a little bit. So, and that's my third and last. At this particular point in time, what I like to do is just go, okay, I've made three rolls. Again, that can be changed to, uh, you know, to be a more conservative version, maybe just two, two rolls. But um, at this point, I'm starting to look at my max loss. I don't want to lose more than one and a half times my, um, you know, my credit that I, that I brought in because I'm, uh, you know, over time, this is going to be a highly profitable, more, you know, 80% 80, 80 plus uh, profitability. So I'm looking at, you know, more like, you know, nine, 10 winners and maybe two, possibly three losers or break evens. And uh, so I don't want to lose, uh, you know, months and months of, of what I've worked hard for. So I usually like to cap that off at about a one and a half uh, times my original credit. And so I'm just going to look for that. I'm not going to roll anymore. I'm just going to say, okay, if I hit my max loss, I'm out. And if I don't, I'm going to stay in and I'm, I'm going to decide, you know, how long do I want to stay in uh, before getting out of this trade. But usually I would stay in until um, it, it hits at least a profit, some, some profit target. And you can lower that profit target instead of maybe 70% of original credit, maybe it's 50%. Um, especially after this move. I mean, uh, let's go take a look at the price chart. I think I got into the trade here and um, you know, we're down almost 100 points in a very short amount of time uh, since I put this trade on. And the volatility has, has spiked up quite a bit. I think I put it on, we were about a 2021 20, volatility um, for this particular monthly cycle, and now we're at 27. So that's also, um, you know, hurts a little bit, brings this T plus airline down. So, um, but, you know, I've, I've tried to keep this trade. Uh, again, I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to keep these uh, puts, shorts, as, or shorts in this case, the puts, um, as far away from the market as possible um, to let it kind of settle and make a profit. And if it doesn't, if it continues to go against me, um, then I have my, my max loss and I'll just get out. Um, most of the time that doesn't happen, but when it does, at least I have, you know, my max pain and I'm done. Um, so in this particular case, uh, you know, we chopped around quite a bit. From that point but it never hit my max loss uh, so on the 18th and let's go to excuse me the next month in february 18th let's go to the day before um you know we had recovered even though it had chopped around and even gone lower uh, but we had recovered enough to where um, it never had hit my max loss i uh, continued to recover and on the 18th Uh, I felt that um, let's go to the actual where the trade is left here. It's time to start uh, peeling these off. Um, so that's uh, a little bit later on in the morning. I went ahead and took this trade off for a nice little profit of about 4.51%. Um, let's see here. Uh, Dennis is asking me a question, so I'm or a couple people are asking questions. Let me answer those real quick. Do you ever roll out in time to reduce the number of extra contracts? Uh, not in this particular trade. This one just is in. Is, I usually stay in one expiration month. Um, I usually have two expiration months on at, at, at the same. They you know overlap for a little while, um, usually because of the days of uh, days to ent to enter the trade are a little bit longer. Um, so I don't uh, roll out in time for this particular trade. I like to stay within the same contract month, and the next contract month is going to be a completely different trade. Um, not that that can't be done, but it's just not the way I trade this. Um, so it's not like a time traveling type trade. Uh, Dennis is asking me how much is max loss? Max loss. Oh, and then you're also saying one point is exactly one and a half times the original credit. So generally, when I first put the trade on, I look at the original credit after slippage and commissions and everything, and I just multiply it by one and a half times, and I keep that as a guide. I definitely don't want to go further. You know, sometimes if the market's moving fast, you don't have a choice, but I could also 
shrink that up a little bit as I'm making adjustments. But that's my that's my guideline, one and a half times the original credit. And like I said, it you know it's uh, uh, doesn't happen very often. So, but you know of course it can. Uh, let's see. Uh, Rich is asking me, do you put this on as four credit spreads or two condors? Um, I put this on as four credit spreads, but you can put it on as two condors. It's just, um, you know, it depends on what you feel comfortable with, um, uh, you know, getting filled. Uh, a lot of times the, 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 the fewer um, strikes that are involved, like a two-legged strike is a lot, or two-legged um, uh, spread as opposed to a four-legged spread is usually a lot easier and faster to get filled. Um, than a, you know than the full four-legged spread, but if you find that you're getting filled very quickly on uh, the four-legged, you know, the full condor, then that's probably an easier way for you to do it. I personally prefer to just put them on as separate separate um, credit spreads. Um, and then uh, being asked, how do you set up contingent orders for exits? Um, I use Thinkorswim, so I'm not sure what you're using, um, as mentioned by your student on the cruise. <laughs> Yeah, um, I not I think he uses Thinkorswim as well. Either he uses that or IB. I'm not sure, but I use Thinkorswim, and there's um, and I'm, I'm sure whatever you're using has an ability to uh, enter a contingent order for an exit, um, and that could be your choice. I would do it at the beginning of uh, you know anytime I see uh, the spread getting to let's say 40 or 50 cents, um, then I would probably say you know just automatically put in a closing order and give it some wiggle room, some slippage. Um, but that's that's what I would do. So you can you can put that on at the very beginning of the trade to say, hey, if this spread gets to uh, you know 40 or 50 cents, um, you know, or maybe even a little bit more, whatever you feel comfortable with, uh, close close this spread, and um, you know maybe put it in as a limit order plus 10 cents or something like that, or five or 10 cents or whatever you think, and that's a, a good guideline. Uh, and Robert saying uh, the only reason to put the order in as a full condor would be if there was a ticket charge or minimum. I think yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm working with um, I'm working with uh, uh, one dollar per contract, and I'm not um, uh, I don't have any ticket charges. And I, I think that uh, through capital discussions, um, you could get the same type of or even better. Uh, commissions from Thinkorswim. They, I know they have some um, uh, special deals with uh, Livevol, uh, where you can get even lower commission rates. Um, so that wouldn't be an issue. But if you do have a, a, a ticket charge, um, then uh, uh, that would be uh, something to definitely consider putting on as a full condor. It's just it's easier to get. You know, like I said, the, the fewer legs you have, the easier it is to get uh, filled. Um, and then uh, Emmerich's asking, what's the criteria for adjusting? I like to adjust early. I'm not waiting for like a 20 um, delta. Um, it, there's a little bit of wiggle room, but what I like to do is I like to see like when my shorts, whether they're on the calls or the puts, uh, when they start to get close to a 16 delta is when I start to look. Sometimes I do it earlier, um, especially if I can get a really nice roll. I might even do it at 14. But a lot of times if I just, you know, have a little alert that says, hey, when that hits or gets close to 16, is it 15, 16, whatever, um, then it gives me the wiggle room to do an adjustment early. Even if it, you know, the market's moving and it moves up uh, before I get the adjustment in, it's still, you know, a pretty early move as opposed to uh, what a lot of standard um, condors wait for a 20 uh, delta in the short. And I think that's just waiting too long. Um, you're getting a little hurt a little bit too much. You're just losing a little bit too much money on that kind of a roll. Um, and then I'm going to answer one more question before doing the last. Ooh, I'm, actually, I'm running out of time. Um, so uh, I'll just go over that one briefly. Um, this is uh, how close to the mid, midpoint of the bid ask you typically get on these trades. Um, you know, I've been trading the Russell for a long time, and I always put in my orders at the midpoints to the, at the beginning, um, unless I really need to get out of something or really, you know, need to do an adjustment, then I'll give, you know, maybe 10 cents or um, or more. It just depends on what's going on, especially if it's a contingent order. You don't know what's going to happen, so you want to give it a little more wiggle room. But a lot of times I'll get hit at about a nickel, nickel to a dime off of the mid, sometimes the mid. It just depends on what's going on in the market. But I always try, if I'm at, in front of my computer, I always try for the mid price, see if I get it. I'm pretty impatient, so I'll just change, give them a nickel and uh, they don't get it filled. Okay, I'm, in, I'm still impatient. I'll give them a dime. Okay, that's it. I'm not going to give you any more. Uh, it just depends on what I'm doing, though. If it's a if it's getting into a trade, 
uh, I'm not going to give them very much. If it's making adjustment, then yeah, okay, I need to do this. So here, take what you need, you know, as long as it's reasonable, but, um, uh, you know, I want to get out of that bad side pretty quick. So I'll be a little bit more uh, forgiving on that and hope that they are as well. Um, so um, we're running out of time here. It's already been an hour, but I just want to really quickly go over the uh, March trade. I did a March one, which I closed, or excuse me, an April one, which I closed today. And that one was entered on which date? The 28th. So we kind of things were kind of settling down, not really. <laughs> um, on the 20, oh, 28th of January. There we go. On the 28th of January, let's go to April. It was uh, put on, you know, about after 10:30. Uh, again, same kind of thing. Now, in this particular case, I put it on the week earlier. With all of that kind of volatility um, and movement, I did mention that I like to put these on um, sometimes with even more days to go. Again, I like Thursdays. Uh, so this one was with 78 days to expiration. So I want to get as far out as possible, especially when we have a lot of stuff uh, going on. And in this case, it seemed like we were already kind of setting ourselves up for a higher volatility environment. So I went ahead and put it on a little earlier. Could have put it on the week after, but um, in that kind of a situation, that's my rule, go out a little further. Um, so again, chose uh, uh, just 10, 10 uh, contracts for each spread. And on this particular case, um, started it on the 28th and didn't have to do anything until the 8th of February, where I closed out some of the calls uh, a little bit later on in the day. So I uh, took off some of the calls right there. A couple days later, on the 11th, Thursday, I closed out, oops, there we go, I closed out the remaining calls, and um, uh, this trade kind of bounced around back and forth until, and I could have taken it off earlier, um, but I, I kind of thought, oh, it'd be fun to kind of see where it's at today, um, so I just kind of left it alone, and since we're running out of time, I'm not going to go through every single day, I just kind of left it alone. Um, and um, I could have easily taken it off yesterday or the day before, but um, I just went ahead and took it off today. I mean, again, it's already, you know, close to the 70% uh, uh, of my original credit. I've only been in the trade for 26 days, and it's, you know, already up there. Uh, you know, you're talking like I think I ended up getting 7.94% after slippage and commission on this one. So, you know, I would have easily, I would have gotten out of it probably earlier than that, but um, uh but I was, you know, kind of wanted to see what it did today just to show you guys. So, um, but again, I mean, you know, depending on the timing, um, especially in a wild market like that, it could have, you know, had a little bit different results. Uh, but again, I like to get in on Thursdays. Those are my favorite days to kind of take advantage of uh, time decay over the weekend, but uh, not having that time decay gone, um, which a lot of times it is on Friday. Usually in higher volatility markets, they don't really take out a lot of that um, theta until uh, the next week, depending on, you know, if there's a lot of uh, market risk over the weekend, but sometimes they do. So I want to, I want to take advantage of uh, collecting that data if I can by getting in on a Thursday and then, you know, increasing the number of days to expiration of getting into the trade um, in the higher volatility markets. So it kind of wraps up my examples. Um, let's go back to the presentation. Um, and um, I don't see any additional questions. Um, so I just wanted to show you guys, um, so this is basically um, a new service that I'm going to have uh, that um, is going to, you know, start up pretty much right away. I, I might as might get into a trade as early as tomorrow or probably the next week most likely. So I think I'm just going to wait until uh, next week, but I will be having, uh, you know, a WebEx to introduce everything um, uh, before that and, and um, uh, you guys can watch and, and uh, get some information about the trade a little more detail. Um, and uh, Tom has created a nice little page. This is the link. Um, unfortunately, because the chat box is not working properly, I cannot send you the link to everybody all at once. <laughs> I would have to send it out to every single person who signed up. And the trial period would be the standard 15, 15 days 
uh, Peter. Um, but I'm going to go to this. Uh, it's not a link here, so I'm going to have to put that in. Um, I'll just go to that page. So if you if you go to that link, or if you go to Capital Discussions, um, let's see if I go to. If you're not logged in, you go under education. It's here, Amy's Nested Iron Condor Alerts. If you are logged in um, and you're in the uh, member page, then I believe under classes, it'll be there. Uh, in weird or where is it? Nested Iron Condor. Oh, well, it would have, a, if you're not signed in, it would have a little thing where you can sign in for it here. Um, but um, let me go back. Uh, to here and as you can see Tom thank you very much he started a nice little page here for me so if you want to do a 15-day free trial you can click on that um, and I do have some specials just for a very short time um, so it's going to be you know basically the same as as far as the one month three months and six months the same as the weird or um, you save money if you go out um, if you have longer time periods um, but, and I usually don't do this, I don't have a um, yearly option, so it's only good till Sunday, but if you want to sign up and you want to pay for a year uh, and go ahead and jump on that, it's only good until Sunday, it'll be $950 for a year, so you save quite a bit. Um, and then there's also bundled, since I'm doing another service, if you want to have both of my services, um, then I have some uh, pretty good savings for that Tom put together for both services bundled together, and you get both. Uh, again, I'm going to have just for a few days, a, a yearly option for that as well. So, um, so that's uh, so that's that. I hope you guys um, come check it out. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this presentation. Um, Tom, you want to say anything? Um, yeah, if there there are quite a few people already signed up for the Weird Or. So, if you want to take advantage of the combination price, just let me know via an email, and then I'll get you a special link that has an upgrade price that'll be a, like a combination. So you can save on the you know the two together. Uh, whoops, I hit the wrong thing. Um, there we go. Um, great. So I think that's it. I don't see any other questions, but if anybody has any more questions, um, feel free to ask. Uh, of course, if you guys sign up, um, whether it's on my Weird Or or the Nested Iron Condor, um, there's a you know ask a question tab that um, will uh, go through all of the. Uh, I mean, you guys can ask me any questions, and I, I, I go through those pretty much, you know, every day and see if anybody's asking me questions. So you can ask me directly. Um, and I think that's about it. So hopefully, uh, like I said, you guys will check it out. And uh, so it's a fun trade, super easy, um, and it does pretty well. So, so that's Great, all. Amy. Cool. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for for everybody for joining. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm.